Of the majority of capable and serious painters, Joseph de Camp thinks of himself simply as a craftsman, and holds the conviction that the only way for an artist to demonstrate his superiority is to do his work well. That is the sole professional test, and to exclude all side issues is a wholesome policy. A painter who is always busy with his legitimate work has but little time or inclination to pay much attention to anything else. The art of painting is difficult enough to require a lifetime of single-minded study for its mastery. Mr. de Camp has been all his life concentrating his faculties on this one aim, and he finds that the great thing to achieve is the art of seeing. He has done what he could to help preserve the sound traditions of painting, and there are those who believe that more has been accomplished in this direction in Boston than in any other American city. Mr. de Camp has been free in the past for his policy of experimenting, reaching for further challenges, and trying out new methods in painting, for he has not been above the desire to know how much new methods of expressions were worth, and he has felt that the only way to find out was to employ these approaches in actual practice. He has tried out many of the new ways for his own satisfaction, to see what they amounted to, since that is the way to learn and to progress. His past interests were varied, having begun his studies in Cincinnati, Ohio, under Frank Duvenek, and later being influenced by the great Spaniard Velázquez, then to the Impressionist viewpoint of the day. The deep earnestness and absorption in his work are characteristic of him and his conversation is energized when he talks shop. It is professional discourse carried to the superlative degree of intensity and authority. His enthusiasm is boundless, and his talk is concise and passionate. He had been for many years a teacher of painting, and his pupils in the Massachusetts Normal Art School can testify to the value of his intelligent and sound methods and his great knowledge. Joseph Rodefer de Camp was born on November 5, 1858, and he showed talent at drawing from an early age. In these early records, it is stated that de Camp was one of the young Americans who accompanied Duvenek on his second trip to Munich. They were a brave little company, they were wholly enthusiasts. Though they encountered difficulties and met privations, in looking back upon their efforts there is nothing to be distressed over. They had youth, determination, and a vision. They didn't have money. They went out to Poling, which is a municipality in Bavaria, they leased an old monastery and worked like mad. The purchase of an old copper jug, a beautiful piece of glazed pottery, or an exquisite bit of tapestry was made only by real sacrifice upon the part of someone of them, who, having seen, bartered for the price but for him and the others, it was a feast for the hungry, art-loving souls of them. In this way they assembled their material for still-life compositions. They also posed for each other when the need for a model was imperative and there was no money to pay for one. Like painter protagonists, they descended upon the Munich exhibitions, with work so fine that it stood out as noteworthy in production even there and at that time. A true testament to their quality and efforts. De Camp gained a great deal from the early days, even in struggles. They counted their sacrifices not at all as a deprivation, but as the price they willingly expended to meet the exacting demands of the profession which they had elected to follow. They stand for much in America's artistic achievement. They were the force behind a great forward-moving epoch, and as their names are seen in sequence the individual effort and accomplishment of each man is great, and in some of them it is little less than stupendous. And here is a list. They are Frederick Vinton, Julian Storey, Theodore Wendell, Frank Currier, Walter McEwen, John W. Alexander, William Merritt Chase, John Twechtman, Joseph de Camp, and his lifelong friend, Frank Duvenek. Who is there that can say, Here the work of these men began, here it ends? No one can say it, for the end was their beginning, and the future was for each a resounding success. Later they separated, some of the company, de Camp among them, going into Italy, to Florence and Venice, with Duvenek and the flamboyant Whistler. Here they began anew the process of absorbing, studying, and paying reverence to the old Italian masters. 
and, here when it is understood, the admiration and respect for the modern painter must come in. The art student stands before these masters of old times, and of all time, with eyes that see with understanding, eyes that are directed into the search of the why and the wherefore of the accomplishment of these older ones until their skill in seeing, their power for doing, is equal to the cleverest painting. But the artist of today bravely turns away to solve his own problem, to take his place in the work that records the artistic achievement of the present, to fail or to succeed along untried paths. De Camp was a most devoted student of the great Spaniard. In another way, who thinks of Duvenek or Whistler in connection with the work of de Camp to place him with his more immediate masters? No one thinks of any of the older painters. De Camp was himself. De Camp was thoroughly equipped with a technical knowledge of his craft. He had more than the academician's skill in drawing. He had a master's superlative power in directing the brush or the pencil. He was thoroughly grounded in his anatomical study. He built his work constructively. However, de Camp seldom required a fixed, rigid pose of his model. He walked around the sitter, studied the head, discovered the texture of the ear, examined its placement, and proceeded in general with much the same line of attack that a sculptor takes. He was painstaking, but so much more the virtuoso painter that in his task accomplished there was no evidence of hesitancy, but every appearance of its having been achieved with the greatest ease. His brushwork was always pleasing, spot-on, and at times almost scintillating. His choice of subject was interesting and vital, and the handling virile. De Camp was what his technique implies, a keen insight and discernment of a love of the beautiful, a respect for truth, an appreciation of the value of colour, and the consistent development, made of him one of America's best painters. De Camp's friends say of him that he was an extraordinary man. He was much more than an excellent painter. His interests were varied, and he was a most interesting man. Once he was fascinated by anything, he had to know about it, with the result that in conversation he would lead off along unexpected and startling subjects. Nothing daunted when he was turned upon high finance, nature study, or an engineering project. De Camp was not a prolific painter. However, he was such a faithful toiler that he was represented at most of the great exhibitions and the usual annual events. Perhaps it was among the smaller exhibitions that the ten American painters used to bring out that de Camp was seen to the greatest advantage. They were a chosen, selected company, sympathetic toward each other, earnest and determined, lifting up a protest in the finest sense of the word. At these times they certainly gave their very best and the exhibitions were among the finest that New York had to offer. It would be one of the most delightful retrospective events possible if the work of these ten men could be assembled and exhibited today as evidence of their achievement and their place in American art history. It does not seem possible that there could be a finer treat to the general art-loving public. Now turning to the painting by de Camp of the guitar player, owned by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and is one that was shown first with the ten at their group exhibitions. In this canvas, one sees the lightning and brightening key of de Camp's palette under the current influence of Impressionism that had long tempted him to play with the varying light subtleties, which in this instance was done with reserve but with great charm. His picture is solid and faultless in construction, as they all are. He never resorts to mannerisms or tricks of technique nor does he ever worry the observer with the overly detailed, painstaking evidence of his well-thought-out plan, which seems always to have been delightfully accomplished. He was associated with the Boston group of painters. In that he was of them in the spirit and character of his work, yet in his productions he differed quite a bit. His portrait commissions confined and restricted his work largely to that field. Yet those who knew him best feel that it was a serious loss to American landscape lovers that de Camp left so few of his delightful out-of-door compositions. His portraits are simply and thoughtfully presented without the intimacy of the interior, or the genre. This is to be seen in the portraits ranging from the delightful likeness of his daughter, which he called Sally. In this painting we find the artist is giving his all. 
to the characterization of the youthful Miss, one whom he knows well and who has cooperated to pose for her father. Many an artist has used family not just as casual models but as familiar members. He knows well. Has studied their features in all types of lighting and circumstances. So his work must shine due to this intimacy of love and need to put into paint a wonderful and thoughtful record to share with all of us. As we turn to the painting titled The Blue Veil, de Camp has captured the mystery and delicate light of a young woman who peers directly out toward the viewer. With a charming confident stance, her hand caresses the cane, however, it is feminine, yet not too boldly positioned. The white blouse designed in such a way that it carries us back to her soft pink rosy features, to soften the black attire, that otherwise may appear severe, as in the case of James McNeil Whistler with his black and white portrayals, to where the expression is less important to the whole, sometimes referred to as art for art's sake, and by contrast to Mr. Whistler's picture, arrangement in black, we have two of de Camp's paintings of women in black where the emphasis is clearly on the ladies as fully animated and lively. Each straightforward portraiture, where the black attire complements the sitters as opposed to each canvas being a statement on technique. Both artists express the idea they wish to convey with a slight difference in direction and point to be made, each relevant yet wholly unique. Turning now to the portrait work of Mr. de Camp, what can one say? They are absolutely brilliant works of art, and particularly a treat to any artist who has pursued portraiture as an occupation. De Camp has an inimitable solid and straightforward approach to his craft. He gets down to business, and that business is to please the sitter, give dignity to the individual being commissioned, and designed in such a way as to feel faultless in execution. The technique must never feel like a technique, but rather is the well-rendered characterization. It must be to where one feels we know the sitter, breathing as it were, on canvas, not unlike the Spaniard master artist Velázquez, where the atmosphere is alive and very satisfying in all aspects while functioning as an artwork. In an examination of the many works by de Camp, particularly focusing on portraits, we have a story that we found around his wonderful and dynamic painting of Theodore Roosevelt, currently in the Harvard Art Collection. While the reproduction is not very clear, it remains a great portrait to discuss, which allows us to learn of its reviews and commentary as follows. It was in the winter of 1911 an exhibition of Mr. de Camp's paintings was held at the St. Botolph Club Gallery, Boston. Of the collection of seventeen pictures, ten were portraits, including the full-length and life-size likeness of Theodore Roosevelt presented by his classmates to the Harvard Union there can be no division of opinion about the merits of Mr. de Camp's portraits. And this portrait of Mr. Roosevelt is no exception to the rule. The personality of the man is exhibited with an altogether commendable completeness. It is neither caricatured nor flattered in the least, but is set forth with an almost scientific spirit of impartiality and dispassionateness. Mr. de Camp never idealizes his sitter. His method is to get at the truth through the sound treatment of visible external facts, and if he does not always give the whole reality, it is at least certain that he tells nothing but the truth. The sterling qualities of the portrait of Mr. Roosevelt are the merits of a sure and confident hand, one who is supremely able to get the job well done. Apart from his all-consuming portrait trade, many of which were men, in the day, De Camp had a lighter side of preferences he chose to paint on his own time, which included the female, painted both at work or play, in a softer format of sorts as in the interior setting, or, when he could, painting the figure outdoors in unusual compositions. This departure from his duties and trade permitted De Camp to experiment and utilise the artist's prerogative to be himself, not worry about what others might deem worthy, but to be honest, make the effort to find new challenges and grow ever more into the exploration that nature provides. It is difficult to locate many drawings by de Camp, but it would be a treat to see his thinking in that area and medium. It is hoped as well that many more works by de Camp will come to light from private collections, 
that will allow the art-loving public to see his full value as the true artist he is. In this tribute to the wonderful talent of Joseph de Camp, his many-sided approaches to picture-making, and his ability to display the draftsmanship in his portrait work, we hope you enjoyed his work as much as we did in presenting it to you. We look forward to reviewing many more well-deserving artists and movements that are yet to be unveiled. So with that, thank you for being a subscriber, if you haven't already done so, and leave a like, if you will, as it helps the channel to grow and reach many more art lovers. And as an aside, it should be noted that the studios of the Harcourt Building in Boston had a disastrous fire in 1904, where de Camp also had his studio, in which many artists lost their homes, studios and work. It was particularly sad in that the artists virtually had to start all over with no other record of past accomplishments. De Camp made the difficult decision to be even more productive and took on many commissions at a reduced rate in order to build up for his loss. A collection by this great effort of remarkable paintings is the result we have today. A real tribute to the painter's work ethic. And finally, with that, we hope to see you next time, so until next time. Bye for now.